Hey everyone, it's 5.48 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 16th, 2022 years from... Today I want to just talk a little bit about the concept of loss and redemption and its necessity and importance <clears throat> and how we can... I think how we can better understand the current condition that the world is in and the current condition that certain people are in. Well, everybody's in because everybody has a part to play. That's why they're here. So I've been thinking a lot about this. Now, you know, I'm not the kind of guy who can talk about subjects like this in a detached sort of way. I guess there are people like that. Um, I've come across folks that they certainly seem to be genuine. <clears throat> and um, they understand to one degree or another what's going on. And they have this ability to talk about a lot of it in a detached way. I don't know if they have the ability to think about it in a detached way, too. I don't have that ability. I put, when I come across something important, and it doesn't matter what context it's in, this is the thing. This, so much is dependent when we're, lo we're, we're looking at topics and themes, anything being done, the individual, the makeup of the individual, it's really important to how something is done, to how something is approached. I do this with anything. This is why I was such a bad student in school. Because of the way I was designed, I approach everything in a way wherein I will devote all my resources mentally, emotionally, physically, <clears throat> to whatever that is. So, I can't talk about a lot of things in a detached way. Because how can you? How can anybody talk about, let's just say, the state of things today? How can a German and an Irishman talk about the history of... <sighs> the so-called Germans and Irish, which, again, I have to clarify this, going back to, for instance, the video I made about the Ashkenazim and Sephardim and them going under the banner of the Jays, entirely different people. The title German, the title Irish, is, again, one of those subtly deceptive uh, namesakes. German just really, to us, practically today, just means people who were born in a certain region, a, uh, um, a geographical expression that may have had one or more languages positively linked to one or more people. That's all it means. It To say German doesn't specify the actual tribe, the lineage, the family. This is why I don't positively say something like, the Polish are this, because there are a number of my tribesmen who have been integrated into the culture and region and language of Poland, 
who are in fact my blood genetic kin. Lithuania, Latvia, Croatia, um, yeah, Eastern Bloc countries, Ukraine, Russia. When you find white people, you're going to find intermixed within them. And this is, this is the case in, in, in every European country to this day. <clears throat> Multiple tribes, families of what we would just see as Caucasian, white people, but different. They're different in their makeup, they're different in their lineage. And they happen to be my kinsmen and closely related to me. And others that share that naturally they, they share the nativity of those geographic expressions and perhaps languages they don't share the lineage the genealogy and the, that is important so i know it's it's kind of tough because the more one learns about language and terminology and how important it is the state of the world and people and all that the more dissatisfied one is forced to become with the current terminology. So, um, that's unfortunate. However, so if I'm talking about Germans, and I have to use the word German, um, I'm speaking of the lower class people, the people like myself, the people um, at the bottom, not treated well, treated as a slave class, the kind of people who were sold into uh, being mercenary soldiers by force, thus the Hessians, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, children's crusade. So all of those children who were sold into slavery from Germany many centuries ago, uh, under the false pretenses that they were going to be taken to Palestine uh, as the Holy Land and help to rebuild it and do good missions work. But what happened was they were actually sold into slavery to, you know, blacks and Arabs in Africa. I would posit that <clears throat> more of my people have been sold to non-white people than any non-white has ever been sold to or possessed by my people. And I'm not talking about Caucasians, I'm talking about my tribe. Tribes. <sighs> so it's nearly impossible for me to talk about things that affect my people, because my people are my family, like my children, my family, without strong emotion. If I talk about the people running the world and how they do it, they do it through deception. They're very, they're very smart. The way they do it is very subtle. And they know their stuff. They do a lot of it, you know, legally with contracts and, and things like that, sure. But it's not... <clears throat> These people who try to teach that if you just know the contracts and you just know the language, you just know how you can opt in and opt out, then, you know, you can perform that and you'll be all right. They obviously don't really know who's running things or their tactics. To a degree, you'll get somewhere if you understand, if you understand the form and the function of the system that they have in place. You can get here and there. You can move around in it, but when they take a notion to take something from someone, to destroy someone, it doesn't matter. Those same legal documents that they put in place that a lot of people now teach that, you know, you need to understand how this works and how you can work outside of it and everything. It means shit to them when they decide that they're going to take something. This is why 
when I talk about them, besides the fact, you know, that they do use proxy armies, they introduce peoples that they know uh, are, are going to be antagonist peoples to the their main obstacles and competition, which are the Israelite people. These are their absolute biggest problem. And I don't know enough about what history is very accurate to know why they look at us that way. Because, here's why. I, I don't think amongst all white people, all tr white tribes, that we are necessarily the best at anything. Um, but I do actually think that f we could probably take the stories that we hear about the Gaulish barbarians, the Gothic barbarians, the Germanic barbarians, a certain, um, a certain amount of those stories we can probably take to heart. That we have been consistently a complete pain in the ass. And not just a headache, far beyond it. And it's probably one of the reasons why they see us that way. And it's at a certain point in time, I'm sure they probably decided we're not going to be able to control them this way. Even if we do these certain deceptive things, we're still not going to be able to control them this way. And they found more and more and more effective methods of controlling us. One of those, of course, being separating children from their parents. So you separate a people from their history. And you also teach them a different language. Which I find really interesting because you can look at German and you can look at Gaelic or Celtic. And you can spot the large amount of Obri roots within those two languages. But then what you do is you see a lot of um, you see a lot of other influences of other languages. And to the point what it appears to be is that certain languages were forced upon us at various times. And what happened is our own language just kept bleeding through. Which is, it's not my opinion, that's not a fantasy either. If you check the philologists and linguists of the past specifically, where they were a lot more honest in how they approached the phenomenon of language and peoples and how the two tend to uh, stay together. A tongue stays with a people. Even if you force another language on them, that tongue that was assigned to them at a certain point in time bleeds through. Bleeds through. It's why the people of um, what they call Greece, they will not speak a pure Greek, their own native tongue that's been impressed in them like DNA, just can't help but bleeding through. And that's the most obvious in German, probably because we were the latest comers to Europe. The Gauls were early. And that has a lot to do with, of course, the uh, the Second Kings 17. And you can cross-reference that with a few other, you know, the the prophet Hosea was, was prophesying that that would happen. And we see it recorded also in two chronicles. Um, they came early. The people they called Germanics, they came later. And no matter how much they tried to impress other languages on us, Latin-based languages, which, uh, like the people of Italy, Spain, and France speak Latin-based languages, Greek-based languages, which Greek does not seem to be uh, inherent to uh, any part of Europe. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Greece was the uh, Greek, what we know, even ancient Greek or Koine, modern Greek, was the language of the kingdoms of Yun, the East Asian kingdoms. That's where I absolutely believe that Greek probably mostly came from. And that's why we see it as part of this, what they call the Proto-Indo-European family. Now, it could be wrong, and it could go back even further than that, maybe all the way back to Genesis 11. But that's that's what I've seen as far as where things were picked up, 
where I believe that uh, the Greek language was introduced. It's changeover from ancient Greek to Koine, I'm not exactly positive. But we can see a lot in tongues. Yeah. <clears throat> Think about it. It's why these people predominantly use Latin and Greek in most of the language that they use. And then, of course, they designed English based, I believe, on the bleed through languages, which would be a, a combination of Obri, what's called Greek, um, maybe ancient and Koine Greek. There are other variations that, you know, of, of Greek, they say, but that not many of them are, are typically used. Latin, there's a few variations of Latin, like I just expressed. So, what happens is when I start talking about them and their deceptive policies and their deceptive actions, I can't help but really be disgusted. I mean, right, like right down to my core, disgusted. Maybe the one, one of the reasons is this, and, and so therefore, I can't speak of them in, in, even in a way that shows maybe not a respect, but a, um, at least an affirmation for their genius right? Their evil genius. There's a lot of ways that someone can uh, express and implement genius. I, I just personally think the way that they do it so that they can retain all power at anyone else's expense. By the way, let's keep that in mind is, in my opinion, just the worst way you could express a genius. And these people are very, very smart indeed. They're very intelligent. Way more intelligent, in my opinion, than the people that a lot of us think are at the top of the pyramid, which is, remember, that's a silly idea. Their imagery even says it. The top of the pyramid, it's not there. The capstone is... It's invisible. It's ever-present, but you can't see it. So if you can see a people and identify that people, they are clearly visible. They are probably the most privileged, but not necessarily at the top. And I think the more that one <clears throat> gets to know these people in a personal way, like I've said in older uh, briefs, I've known a number of these people on a personal level. These are not the people who have designed and implemented the world that we languish in today. They're just not. The most privileged, yes, because that class with that empty claim of who they're supposed to be, that's very important. That's very important in the the construct that exists. Those people, if any of them are listening, I, I would really, I would tell you this. These people at the top who have given you all that privilege that you have, and you know that the overwhelming majority of you have taken that privilege uh, very gladly, very happily, and have used it in very malicious ways, and you damn well know it. So you're not innocent. But I'm not saying anyone is innocent at this point in time. I think everyone has guilt in different ways. But know this. Those people who are actually at the top, who give you all that privilege, they're going to sacrifice you. And I think they've already started. If you look at the shills out there, even the shills who for a long time wouldn't even talk about this certain class of people. Now that's just about all they talk about. Yeah. So, you know, the very people that you've 
been in league with, who have given you all this privilege and a name and kept you very safe, they're going to throw you right to the dogs. You better believe they are. And, and that will serve their ends. This is for everybody out there. <clears throat> I don't care who you are. If you serve this system in any way, if you serve this system by being a, a good little Romans 13 Christian, you're guilty. And they will throw you to the dogs too. They'll destroy you when it suits them. I don't know if they necessarily have a plan to necessarily destroy all of a given people. I guess people throw around the G word because it's it's emotional. You'll get an emotional reaction when you throw the G word around. <clears throat> but I don't know that that's necessarily their aim. They're probably calling again. <clears throat> I think they uh, have it planned that they're going to do a large call again. Uh, I do honestly sometimes think if they wanted to do the G on my people, they would have, well, I'm sorry, not wanted to, but if they could have, they would have. They would have already. They would have a long time ago. Just like, for instance, if they could have destroyed uh, all of the copies of the Bible, the books of the Bible, the Law and the Prophets, they would have a long time ago. Thus the need for other languages and the Masora, and very carefully designed, thought out translations into specific languages, most specifically, of course, English, <clears throat> since it is the lingua franca, and then very carefully contrived designs of doctrines, modes of thought. That's how they had to deal with it. So I don't know if they're going for another G. Genocide. Don't want anyone to mistake what I'm saying. Necessarily. But when you look at what they're willing to do, and what they've done to your own people, if you can look at that in a detached way, I'm amazed. It's just simply not in me. So when I talk about them, I might use words like, you know, cowardly, cowardly, mincy little faggots. Because that's what I think of them. They are, they're like little jailhouse snitch bitches. And I know this because I've spent plenty of time in jailhouses. The, the way it works, somebody can actually control a specific pod. So, you know, in some jails you have pods and some you have blocks. And even in prison you might have blocks or pods. <clears throat> it's just a section. It's a closed off. It's a closed system. Okay. And um, the way they have jails designed, for the most part today, to maximize the amount of people that you can control with the, the smallest amount of guards and resources, is they set up a, a satellite one side. They might build the, the, the building with certain satellites. They'll set up a satellite where you have a central a control, a main in the middle, and a hallway that goes around. It's usually a square hallway. So the control room will be square. The hallway around it will be square. It will have certain other hallways leading to certain other sections, places. But what they do is they have fanning off from those like, um, kind of like those old iron crosses. The way that you see them, you have a central piece and then you have um, these sections that actually start and they taper wide from there and they'll have two press next to each other sharing um a central wall 
and then a, another two, and they might be a little bit smaller and, and not as deep because they'll put some of the two tier ones right next to each other. They'll put, uh, if they have a minimum, which is all open bunk, which sucks. If you don't like hearing people snore, they'll put two of those together. They'll put maybe, um, a certain classification of women with, um, women's max together. And then maybe they'll put like a uh, Chomo PC protective custody on the other side of the wall of like men's max. And those usually be small pots, but that's how they do it. And it's fanned out. And so only two guards are watching this, this huge amount of people. And then they have main control who are watching the different satellites. Okay. And so, so on and so forth. Um, but a pot. So just for anyone who, who hasn't been in jail or prison or anything that doesn't understand how it's designed in it, that's how it's designed. So take a pod, medium. We'll take medium pod because medium has individual cells. We're usually two people per cell unless it's overcrowded, which jails try to stay overcrowded because it's more money. So you might have one guy on the floor in what they call a stack of bunk or a boat. But they're all individual cells. The doors are locked at a certain time. They're opened at a certain time in the morning. But throughout the day, they're, they're kept open. If you close it, they'll open it for you. But if you keep doing it like a, a little kid, they'll just leave you locked in until a certain time. I have seen guys, they were real slick. Guys that have basically been in and out of, of juvies and prisons their whole life. Okay. Probably, you know, guys probably in their thirties or forties, at least guys in their twenties is still too full of piss and vinegar and, and idiocy to, to really make it work. But guys who could essentially control a pod, not simply by might. Not that they would go out in the middle of the pod and they would say, I'm in control of this place and whoever doesn't like that can come challenge me. Because here's what's going to happen. Even if nobody could challenge this person and win, they would still resist them. They'd resist. They, they, they would absolutely resent this person and they would conspire against this person. Eventually they would take this person down one way or another whether you know it's four of them that catches the guy in the shower or something and and just beats him to a pulp or they get him removed somehow do something that's going to happen they're just they're not they're not going to be okay with that so because it's not okay that's the whole point Somebody saying, you know, this is all mine. You guys are under me. I'm going to do as I please. I'm going to run this as I want. And whatever you think, I don't care. This It's my way. Why? Because uh, I can hurt anyone. People are going to resist that. So the the real slick ones... They'll come in and they'll clock the place. They'll spend some time figuring out who is who and people's weaknesses. Who is willing to trade their food? And you get very little food in county. They feed adult males by state law. And I'm talking Indiana. I've I did a little bit of time in a Florida jail, but most of it in Indiana. They only have to feed adult males 1,200 calories a day. So you figure 400 calories per tray. They'll figure out who's willing to trade a, f a full tray of food for a shot of coffee, which is a jailhouse spoon, usually the round soup spoon. Somebody might try to get away with giving you a shot in the, the thinner common spoons which you'd have to call them on if they tried that that's a, a shot is a scoop in 
heaping and it's it's freeze-dried coffee the stuff is like crack though it's ridiculous all the caffeine in it <clears throat> anyways <clears throat> they'll figure out who's willing to do that and most of the people willing to do that were drug addicts on the street crack meth heroin and and most of them are coming in they're detoxing so a lot of them once they get past the initial uh, pangs of detox they'll just try to replace that with something else and and coffee is one of those things commissary also has a lot of sugars on it and other things because they the people running these uh, the jailhouse scams not the criminals so-called in in the pods but the state and the state contractors they understand the state of people I shouldn't use state again the condition of people that come in especially the addicts the alcoholics and so on and so forth and that it's common for addicts to try to replace one kind of drug with another and it doesn't really matter what it is if they can't have anything else they'll take that one they'll figure out who is who they'll figure out who's the gamblers who actually are degenerate gamblers you know the kind that can't stop playing when they really should they'll figure out who that is they'll figure out who is is just so freaking homesick they're so homesick that they're just distraught and they're emotionally um, fragile and suggestible okay um and they'll figure out who the people are that really don't don't give a shit they're just kind of doing their time they get store from grandma or the girlfriend or something they'll get them all clocked they'll figure it out and then they'll figure out a way to work that that whole system and all the people that are in there to their advantage so that they are well taken care of and sometimes looked out for because if they're really smart they'll take care of a few other key people too and then they'll run the place and they'll run the place invisibly is it the honest thing to do no it's not Is it the most manly thing to do? No, it's not. Well, because a man doesn't seek to do that anyways. Because doing that is, is taking from people. It's using people's weaknesses and exploiting them. It's not what a man does. The guys who I've seen that do that or aspire to do that were always without exception and you wouldn't think this probably you wouldn't think this necessarily by looking to them you'd have to interact with them to understand what they were and how they were okay because that's another thing that the way they're acting and what they're doing and how they're accomplishing this is not necessarily reflected in what they look like. This is not going to be the 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 scrubby, greasy, you know, guy. It's probably going to be the guy that you don't expect. For obvious reasons. The only person that would be successful doing that would be the ones that you're not suspecting, the ones that you're not going to immediately look at if they're smart. And I've run into so few of them that are actually smart enough to do that. Most of what I've ever seen is, is guys who aspire to do that. And they manage to sometimes do it to a certain point. But most guys who come in and out of, of county jails are just stupid. A lot of them, there's a lot of them out there that are very manipulative. They're very skilled at manipulation and scamming and scheming and bluffing because they've learned it because they've been doing this for a long time but smart I mean smart like a guy who thinks they they understand human behavior and psychology and they think at least three or four moves ahead no those don't usually come through and here's the thing the guys who I think were smart enough 
to do that, most of those guys would never think about doing some kind of underhanded shit to run the place. And there's one of the problems. So people who do that, people who control through those methods, they know it can't last. It can't. It, it's why things have to cycle in the way that we've seen them cycle for just maybe the last couple few centuries with somewhat reliable information their their system and their cycle breaks down fast you can't do that the way they do it by deception um, abusing people exploiting their weaknesses taking what you want stomping on them it doesn't matter if you have great contracts and language and all this stuff and a system which really looks like it's got it all together because again like I said they're willing to break that anytime it suits them their system can't last so they have to do really extreme things every certain amount of years to compensate for that they have to do extreme things in certain ways in smaller increments of years to compensate for that they need wars to compensate for that they have to kill a lot of people and they have to keep trying to retrain these new people to reprogram these new people and I think they've been trying that for a few centuries now <clears throat> and getting progressively better and better and better and better at it however as good as they get at doing that the thing they can't do is change what people and certain people are at their core. And who knows, maybe at this point in time they have decided that the G is the last resort. Maybe, maybe we're at the end. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Because ultimately, I know it's not going to go their way. But I just want it to end. I'm absolutely tired. So, I have no respect for them, sure. And when I talk about them, I use the most degrading terms possible. Sure. And yeah, here's the thing, you know, <clears throat> you'll see other kingdoms in the Bible when they maybe when they take over the land or they carry some of the Israelites or Judahites away or something, uh, Yahweh will give those people favor with them. And like may will say in the case of Daniel, he actually worked within the government of Babel, maybe a little bit in uh, for Paris or, or Madi, it's two kingdoms together. Sure. These were not the sort of underhanded, scabby cowards that are running things today. This was a completely different form of, of rule, of overtaking a land and a people and ruling it. And I would imagine the dynamics of how it worked then was very different than how they have to do things today. Okay, now all that being said, and it was a lot, it was necessary. I will now follow that up with, but as low as my opinion is of them, as men, as a creature that even <laughs> merits life, I still say that they are absolutely necessary. Absolutely necessary. Specifically for the trajectory of where Israel fell to and degraded to. And if we see Israel doing that, it's, it's a safe bet most of um, most of man degraded was degrading too. This kingdom 
now, the people running things now, are a necessity because of the value of loss and redemption. There is a huge value to losing something and having to redeem it. Oftentimes people don't appreciate things they have until they lose it. And the only way that a lot of people can learn the true value of what they had is by the process, the, the pangs, the time, the effort in redeeming that thing they lost. And at this point in time, it couldn't just be a loss of land or a loss of substance, a loss of, I guess I'll use the word freedom, which I'm, I'm not a fan of. Uh, it couldn't just be that. At this point in time, the loss had to be absolutely complete. An utter, full, top to bottom loss. Loss of land, loss of blessing, loss of privilege, loss of history, loss of literature, loss of language, loss of self. I think after a millennia and a half, the children of Israel had to lose so badly in such a complete way and then have to come to that realization of how much they had lost so much in fact that they they lost their own identity entirely their identity their history everything and then by a process and now all of these losses took place because of the underhanded, slimy faggots that rule the world like a slick jailhouse con man would control a pod. the loss would only be complete in all of those ways that I said if you had uh, the right people at the top doing the right doing the appropriate things to make all of that loss happen in the way it's supposed to happen to make it complete. Then they needed to continue to maintain their power so that the redemption would be difficult. it would be difficult to even understand who we were. It would be difficult to once again understand our native tongue that was given to us and impressed upon us like fingerprints, which we retained and saturates through languages forced upon us 
which is why we see it in Germanic languages, we see it in Celtic languages. That's why I say that you can find Israelites in all of these quote-unquote white countries because you'll find all of these pockets of people speaking oftentimes odd variations of Germanic or Celt. They may identify as whatever. I'm sorry, Polish, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Russian, something, but a culture and a language has stayed with them like, like their own DNA, like their own f facial features. The loss had to be complete. For one thing, so that we could see, little by little, and we'd have to really work have to really work and we could see what our Aliyim known as our God had done to us and why and how he preserved his word and how if if we could get a hold of pretty trustworthy history, we'd find out that they've probably tried the G word. They've tried to destroy the scriptures, the law, the prophets. They've tried. But we're going to have to work. We're going to have to work and strive. We're going to have to give. If you don't do anything else, and you believe any part of this, you really should help somebody who actually is working to bring these things to light. It's part of the law, in fact. This is how we were supposed to maintain our laws, our literature, judgments on the laws, righteous judgments, um, governing of the people and so on and so forth you had to give a certain portion of your gain to maintain that so it's not weird i mean when people say you really should support people <clears throat> who you see and understand are doing good work that's not like that's not a sort of like a money grubbing thing there's there's other ways to grub for money and to do it in a seedy or dishonest way or to ask for money for bad work there's that too if it's good work somebody's doing good work you should support them and i'm not saying that as a hypocrite i did that up until the point to where i got so far along in my own studies and my own work that i became that person i did it I supported people who I thought were doing good work, whether it was missionaries that later I found they probably don't have any business where they are doing what they are, or whether it was just church building organizations, ministries, whatever. If I thought they were doing good, and I can warn you, if, if you send one donation to Peter Hammond, oh my goodness gracious, man, they ain't going to let you go for nothing tell you that right now oh you can't appreciate your loss why you lost it how good it was unless you have to work really hard To even come to understand the size of your loss and the depth of your loss. But to regain what you had. So these people exist not only for the purpose of our complete loss, but also for the purpose of it being so difficult to find redemption. 
pain and suffering and difficulty are an absolute necessity to growth, to wisdom, to compassion, to understanding. Loss is absolutely necessary. And the bigger the loss, the more one will appreciate what it takes to redeem what's lost. So as much as I have no respect for the people running things, they are, right now, an absolute necessity. The way things are as they are now is an absolute necessity to bring about the ultimate good for the whole creation. Not specifically for the sons and daughters of Israel, they are specifically a people under a specific covenant which are being used and have ever been used for about two millennia by Yahweh to show himself in many ways to the rest of the world. This was the purpose he stated to our forefathers, the patriarchs, and restated to the prophets over time and recorded in Scripture. So these people are a necessity. The way things are right now is a necessity. Um, and I believe that all of those who are striving to get back what we lost in the sense of getting back our close, good relationship we had with Yahweh, not everybody having the same level of dynamics in that relationship. But I believe all of those who are striving to see that end fulfilled, no matter how bad the world gets, you don't have to be afraid or worried about how bad these people are and what they do to maintain their power because they're simply where they are to fulfill his will and once he's done with them <laughs> I mean a lot of people feel bad for the condition that us little plebes are in these days. <laughs> huh. I feel really bad for these people when he's done with them. I feel bad for every drop of their DNA that exists when he's done with them. <laughs> Why? Because that's precisely what his pattern is. He will use a people and their own character or lack thereof to accomplish his purposes, specifically in his people. And I just went over why he has the special relationship with the certain people he does. And then when he's through with this people, who he used, but he used according to their desires and their degeneracy and so on and so forth, when he's done with them, it's curtains, let's say. 
It doesn't go well for them. Now, certain kingdoms that were more no noble in the past, he didn't destroy completely. And we can see that in the prophets, and he even says that, that he wouldn't destroy them completely. We can go check Daniel chapter 7. He preserves those older kingdoms to a degree because they weren't complete degenerates. They weren't nearly as despicable just as a life form. They still went after their own desires, did a lot of things, killed a lot of people, did a lot of damage by their own desire. This wasn't something that, per se, Yahweh made them do. This was their desire to do. He used it. Now, don't ask me to understand or explain the complexity of how that works, because my mind is finite. Just because my mind is finite does not mean that something isn't true that I can't grasp. I will freely admit that's the case with the Trinity or a number of other things. If I can't, Just because I can't grasp it doesn't mean it's not true. I admit that. But that's not my only problem with the Trinity. Anyways, just keep that in mind. And, and that's, not, that's not necessarily a reason for anyone to say, Oh, you know, oh good then I, I don't really have to pay attention or be active in ways that I should be or be responsible. Certainly not. Just to say that the kingdom, the world, the system that's in power today is in power for very good reason is certainly not a reason to say that you can continue to be an irresponsible child. Maybe not necessarily you, but the <clears throat> majority of people. It's not an excuse, but it certainly is a reason. And um, I think everyone who is committed to us redeeming what we've lost, somebody who com who's committed to that can understand and appreciate what's going on, and the fact that they are going to be taken care of, come what may. And you can take heart in that. You don't have to understand everything that's going on, because you're probably not going to. If there are secrets being kept from you, and there's no way for you to get to that information, you're probably not going to understand everything. I obviously don't understand why everything happens, because I'm not an insider. I don't have that perspective. I don't think with their minds, and I don't want to. So you don't have to understand everything, but you do have to be responsible. And I believe you'll be well taken care of. So that's it. <laughs> that's it. Just maybe a clarification of the way that I talk about the people ruling the world. And how, even so, I still know that they are an absolute necessity to get done a series of events which are absolutely necessary for the redemption of a people and the world and the creation. There's a cycle that's coming to an end. Thank you, Yahweh. And I'll see you next time.